All right, well, you're turning there, First Timothy chapter 1. Um, a funny thing happens when you become a parent. And I know it was a couple weeks into our oldest Jordan was a couple weeks old. And we were a few weeks into not sleeping very much and bottles and diapers and extra laundry and uh, it just being difficult to go anywhere because now you've got to have the bag and get the car seat strapped in and just all the extra stuff that goes into taking care of a child. And I remember calling my parents a couple weeks into that and just having this realization, hey, thank you for everything you guys did. And it was this, you don't realize it until you're in it, but all of a sudden I found myself as a parent coming to this incredible realization, my parents did way more for me than I realized in the moment. And you don't realize the sacrifices that are made. You don't realize the, uh, the ways that they just gave themselves to, to hopefully give you and I a better chance just financially of being cared for and not having to worry about what I'm going to wear or eat or I'm going to sleep or just sacrifices to be at my stuff. I played high school basketball. My dad never missed a game, even the away games. And just sitting back and thinking about that, sometimes that was getting off work and driving a couple hours and coming to watch the game and driving home and just... You just start to see it in a different light, all of these things that they did for you that maybe you didn't realize in the moment. And maybe it wasn't with a, a parent, but we probably all have somebody like this that we look back on childhood and we didn't realize the sacrifices that were made by somebody in the service. Maybe a, a favorite teacher that you had. And you, as you get older, you begin to realize the time and the effort and the sacrifice that went into providing you a, a class like that or an education like that. Maybe it was a coach that you love, and, and you think back to this, this opportunity you had to play for somebody that you loved. And now, uh, a little older, you realize how much time that took, how much uh, I think just effort that took on their part to give you the opportunity that you had to enjoy it. And as you come to those realizations, and maybe you're, you're even thinking of somebody now, your mind's going to somebody who, who did that for you at some point in your life. Two things happen. One, you become incredibly thankful to that person. And usually in a new way, you realize more than you used to, especially as you get older, um, just what they did for you. And it, it, it should make you incredibly thankful for them. But it does something else as well. It hopefully shapes the kind of person you are now. Because as you think back to your experience and how formative that was for you, for a lot of us, that leads us to want to provide that same kind of experience for somebody else. Maybe that is as a parent or a teacher or a coach or in some way that I can serve people around me as a neighbor, as a boss, as a coworker. That we understand the blessing that it is to have someone sacrifice for us and love us and do more for us than we realize. And so we want to be the kind of people who do that for others. We become thankful and it shapes the way that we live. And as we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 this morning, we really find uh, something similar about the way in which we live the Christian life. I was on a plane coming home from Orlando a few weeks ago reading through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and, and these verses we're going to look at today, 1 Timothy really 12 to 18, are pretty good foundation for the Christian life. And if you're wondering, what does it look like to be a Christian? What does it look like to follow Jesus? What kind of heart should I have as somebody who, who's walking in a relationship with God? Paul really gives us a solid foundation in about six verses here. And he does it by answering three questions. And this is really going to go over the next two weeks. But we're going to answer three questions that if we have the right answers to these questions, it'll put us on the right course for all of the Christian life. Those three questions being, who did we used to be? Who are we now? And where are we going? Who did we used to be? Who are we now? And where are we going? That third question we'll get to more next week. But just to, to try and answer these questions, and that first one being this, that as Paul thinks back about his life with Jesus, as he thinks back about the life that he's lived, he looks back first on who he used to be before he came to know Jesus. 1 Timothy 1, 12, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And one of the things that becomes obvious about Paul, the more you read his writing, is just how thankful of a person he was. And you see this, so he's constantly giving thanks to God, giving thanks to Jesus, giving thanks to the church, and it just seems to flow out of him. And one of the things we're going to see in a text like this is 
when believers rightly understand the gospel, thankfulness will be one of the defining characteristics of their life. And in fact, if you want to just kind of assess your own heart and mind, how well do I understand the gospel? One of the easiest ways you can do that is simply ask the question, how thankful to God am I? Is thankfulness a, a regular part of who I am that it really is, as we see in the life of Paul, a defining characteristic of the Christian life? And we understand something of why Paul was such a thankful person as he looks back on who he used to be formerly in his life. And he uses three words here to describe it. I was a blasphemer, I was a uh, persecutor, and I was an insolent opponent. And if you're not familiar with the background of the Apostle Paul, he, he summarizes his life before he met Jesus in Acts chapter 26, verses 9 to 11. When he says of himself, he says of himself, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus, of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. And, and what you begin to see is there's an incredible course, change of course that happens in Paul's life. He just describes who he used to be. I violently persecuted the church. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 1, these verses were in, what is he saying? I'm thankful to God. I'm thankful to Jesus for appointing me to his service. And the obvious question becomes, how did that kind of change happen in the life of the Apostle Paul? Before we answer that question, it's worth noting here, because I think this is an encouragement maybe you need personally or all of us need for people around us. Because maybe you're here today this morning, and it could be for various reasons, but you've always had the thought, I'd love to grow deeper in a relationship with Jesus. But if I'm being honest... Jesus probably doesn't want to grow deeper in a relationship with me because of the things that I've done in this life. That as you think back to the life that you've lived, the mistakes that you've made, I know I've had instances where I felt like this. I know who I am better than anyone else, and Jesus knows who I am better than anyone else. And there's this honest question or concern or doubt, why would Jesus want anything to do with someone like me? Or maybe it's not for yourself, it's for a family member or a friend or a, just someone you're close to. And you've honestly had this thought recently where you find yourself thinking, I don't think there's any chance they're ever going to make a decision to follow Jesus. He's kind of given up on them, if you're being honest. And one of the things the story of Paul reminds us of as we look at this example here is this. is for us personally and for those people around us who we're tempted to give up on. If Jesus can save Paul, he can save anyone. And if Jesus can forgive Paul, he can forgive you for whatever you've done. My guess is we've all done some bad things. I doubt, unless you've just hidden this deep, dark secret, most of you don't have a story of actively putting Christians to death and closing churches and trying to destroy the gospel. And Paul could say, I've done all of those things. And yet, what does he say? What does he say he found? We're going to see here in a few, few verses. What did Jesus show me? Grace, and mercy, and forgiveness. As Donald Guthrie writes in his first Timothy commentary, if God can call and equip a man like Paul, who at one time was so violently opposed to the gospel, is there any limit to that power? So for those of you who just, you have those people close to you. I have that in my life. A, a family member, a dad who just hasn't had any interest in responding to the gospel, my temptation is just to assume, you know what, it, it's just probably not going to happen. And yet when you're reminded of somebody like Paul, what's the, what's the encouragement you're giving? If Jesus can turn that hard, if Jesus can do that work, how could I ever believe that Jesus couldn't do a work in the life of anyone around me, including my own life, that to believe that I'm so bad that Jesus wouldn't want anything to do with me. If Jesus wanted a man like Paul, he wants somebody like you. And so we're encouraged as we read a text like this. And, and as Paul continues to unpack this, he understands what he deserved from Jesus. He comes to this realization. He's opposing the church. Jesus shows up and confronts him face to face. Paul realizes the error of his ways, the sin that he's been in, expecting judgment, expecting wrath, the things he rightly deserved. And yet, verses 13 to 15, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. 
and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. So Paul receives this mercy, this grace, and this faith, and when you see this teased out, it's easy to understand why Paul was such a thankful person. I was an enemy of God, I received mercy, I deserved judgment, I was given grace, and this incredible change happens in the life of the Apostle Paul, and so he can't stop being thankful to God for this change that God worked in his life. And when he talks about how this change happened, he's one of the best summaries of the gospel in all of scripture, verse 15, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the foremost. And Charles Spurgeon, the well-known preacher, writes of, of Paul's conversion and what he writes here. He says, certainly Paul must have shuddered whenever he remembered his previous acts of persecution. And certainly this would have produced a continual amazement at the incomprehensible gifts of God's mercy and grace. Paul understood all that Jesus had done. It changed the way he saw God. It shaped the course of his entire life. That Paul goes from persecuting the church to now planting churches and writing scripture and training pastors and raising up elders. And as Paul does this, one of the things I love about Paul is he talks about what Jesus has done. And he can't help but break into worship. He's remembering all that Jesus has done for him. And then verse 17, look at this. I received mercy for this reason that is in me as the foremost. Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And he gets to the end of all this and says to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And he just kind of breaks into song as he talks about the gospel. And he realizes what's been done for him. He realizes how Jesus has sacrificed for him. And I was sitting on the airplane reading this text, kind of thinking through it on this couple hour plane ride. One of the questions I kept coming back to over and over was this. Why does my Christian life often look so different than what Paul is experiencing here? Why isn't my life marked by the, the thankfulness I see in the life of Paul here? Why do I, I seemingly find worship so difficult when Paul is just spontaneously breaking into praise as he thinks about all that Jesus has done for him? Why do I find myself with this single-minded focus on the mission that Jesus has given us, that if Jesus came to the earth to save sinners and he's told the church to continue that work, why isn't my life more marked by that mission like, like it was for the Apostle Paul? And I came up with two reasons, and I think we're going to see this in the scripture as we walk through this, but maybe you're wondering that as well. Why does my experience of the Christian life seem so lifeless when compared to, to Paul's that he describes here? Paul had a clear understanding of who he was. Paul had a clear understanding of what Jesus had done for him. And I think part of our inability to experience the Christian life in the way that Paul experienced it and others that we see in Scripture here primarily stems from this. Paul had a clear understanding of who he was before he came to Jesus. I'm not sure many of us do. I'm not sure many of us do. And the reason I say that is this. Paul could look back on his life and say, I know I was an enemy of God. Look what Jesus has done for me. And if I'm just being honest, when I look back on my life, rarely do I look back and say, I was clearly an enemy of God before I came to know Jesus. That I don't see it. That it's not just that I don't have a clear conception of who I was. That that conception of who I was prior to meeting Jesus, and I think particularly, and this was my experience for those who grew up in the church, who have always been around these things, is that we don't necessarily see ourselves as people who needed saving. Others do, and I'm thankful for the work that Jesus does in the life of people like Paul, and who, who obviously aren't figuring these things out. But if I'm being honest, when I assess myself, there's this temptation to look back on my life and to not really see myself as the enemy of God that Paul did, as someone who needed saving. And again, when Paul says something like, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the foremost, we can understand why he would say that. We can understand. He put Christians to death. He put them in prison. He opposed the gospel. Obviously, he was one of the chief of sinners, as he says. But one of the things I wrestled with is, why don't I think about my past more in a, a similar way like to what Paul is here. 
And as we begin to unpack this and begin to ask the question, not just who was Paul before coming to faith in Jesus, but who were we? I think it's, it's easy for many of us who live in this place at this time in human history with the background that many of us had to not see ourselves for who we were before Jesus did a work in our life. Maybe you look around the world and honestly, there's a lot of messed up stuff happening in the world right now. Just even over the weekend, just it seems like things are spiraling out of control. And yet, one of the things that uh, is easy for us to do is to look around at all the things happening around us and to just come to this conclusion, I know I have my faults, but I'm doing pretty well. Like, I, I kind of got it together. Uh, I'm respectable, I'm uh, fulfilling my obligations, I'm taking care of the people I need to take care of. It, it, it kind of boils, I, I, am, I do feel like, again, not perfect, I'm kind of a good person. Maybe God is actually pleased with me, and I don't cause God the headaches that lots of other people cause him, and I fully expect at the end of this life that God won't be happy with everything, but... You know, kind of let me in because I've been good and that's what God wants. And for most people, when you look at the polls and the studies, that's the assumption is that after this life, if there is a God and I stand before him, what matters in the end is that the good outweigh the bad. And it's easy for a lot of us to feel like, yeah, I haven't done terrible, terrible things. I've tried to do good things when I can. And it puts us in this place where the church is filled with people, myself included, at plenty of moments in my life. Where we just don't see ourselves as people needing saving because the reality is we're not as bad as other people. One of the best things I've read over the past few months, I wish I could buy a copy for everybody in the room, is a book called The Unsaved Christian by Dean and Sarah. And as I've been working through that over the course of the last couple of weeks, it spoke well to this text because he goes on to describe the reality of many who have grown up in the church or who have attended church for years, and he says there's a kind of faith among many where there's an admiration for Jesus, there's respect for Jesus, but there's not a desperate need for Jesus because there's nothing we need saved from. He goes on to talk, he says, in that, in that experience of Jesus, uh, that, that's how we're tempted to approach him, that the faith of many is a faith that says again that there's admiration, there's respect, that he's needed, but he's only needed to take the wheel in a moment of crisis, not to do something radical in me. And, and as we think about our own experience of Jesus, this approach to life with God fails at one key point, that if this is the way that most people conceive of God, there's good and bad, and I'm trying to stay on the side of good, and God will be happy with me if I can just stay on good, and maybe God looks at all of humanity and he kind of averages his goodness and draws a line and separates people that way. That if there's a misunderstanding, if there's a place that we go wrong in that kind of thinking, it's this. It's that the line that we draw for who's good and who's bad is very different than the line that God draws. And typically, typically where we get into trouble is by determining goodness by comparing ourselves to other people. Because we can always conceive of a group of people worse than us. Uh, something similar happened to me in high school. Coming into my junior year of high school, I'll be honest, I was feeling pretty good about my abilities as a basketball player. Okay? It's coming in with a little bit of a swagger. And I remember we had our point guard ended up playing Division I basketball, and so I knew he was better than me, but everybody else I felt like I could hang with. And honestly, I came in thinking, you know, I know there are other people who play basketball, but there can't be that many more people who are better at this than I am. And so I had a, a pretty high confidence level at that moment. First game of the season, we're in Louisville playing against the team. Um, and on the bus ride over to the game, some of our players began whispering about this freshman point guard on the other team. And immediately I dismissed it. He's a freshman, I'm an upperclassman. How good could he actually be? And just, uh, just out of hand thought, this isn't that big of a deal. And so we get to the game, and he had to sit out the first quarter for a disciplinary issue. But I remember the start of the second quarter, we're out on the floor, and everybody's matching up with their person. And I'm kind of looking around, and everybody's kind of got somebody. And I turn up the court, and the only person who doesn't have anybody guarding him is the point guard at this point. And so he comes into the game, and he begins bringing the ball up the court. And my first hint that something was wrong should have been... Three of our coaches on the sideline seeing the scenario play out where I was about to guard this freshman point guard. And all three of them screaming, no, 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 no. Okay, that's a great confidence boost in that moment. 
And so I'm standing at the top of the key waiting, and Ray John Rondo starts bringing the ball down the floor. Okay, now if you're familiar with that name, um, current point guard for the Los Angeles Lakers, four-time NBA All-Star, two-time first defensive team, NBA champion in 2008 with the Boston Celtics, okay? And as he comes down the court, and I'm waiting, I might as well not have been on the court, okay? He went around me and scored as easily as if I had just been standing on the sideline watching him. Now, what happened in that moment, as you can imagine, is my conception of my basketball abilities went way down. Because when I could compare myself to my teammates, I thought, I can hang with these guys. When I saw that and what somebody was capable of on the basketball floor, immediately I thought, I can't compete with that. And what changed in that moment wasn't my, my abilities did not change in that moment. What changed was who I was comparing myself to. Okay. Let's bring this into the spiritual life. That for many of us, what happens is we start to feel good about the people we are. Why? Because of who we're comparing ourselves to. And when the comparison shifts from the people around me to the God who created me, again, the things that we do haven't changed, but our conception of our holiness and goodness should radically change in that moment. And as we see scripture, here's the line that scripture draws that really is an uncomfortable line for us, that this line gets drawn good and bad, and over here we have God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and over here we have every human being who has ever lived, and it's a radically different way of assessing goodness and badness in the world. Now again, we hear that, and it's difficult for us to believe that because of the differences we see in people around us. But as long as people around us are the measuring stick of what a good person is, then it's impossible for us to see ourselves clearly in light of who God is and who God created us to be. And Sarah goes on to write, many cultural Christians can say they've met the cultural expectations regarding lifestyle, work, leisure, and family. They've always been led to believe they're good people who have faith and try to do the right thing. They might make a great neighbor, but it doesn't equal God's standard for goodness and holiness. J.I. Packer wrote it this way, unless we see our shortcomings in light of the law and holiness of God, we don't see them at all. And it's when God becomes the measuring stick that we realize how much sin is in all of us, how much evil is in all of us, how far we have to go. And it's why Paul could say in a book like Romans in verses 10 to 12, chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And a little later in verse 23 today, to say, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now that's a heavy judgment that Paul renders on humanity. That we read in scripture this description of all of us. And honestly, we're still left with this question. How is that possible? How can the bad things I do be as bad as the worst things that I see people around me do? And the way that we begin to understand that is we start to see the sin underneath all sin. It's not just what we do, it's what's underneath our sin that ties us to the rest of humanity. Martin Luther, the well-known church reformer, once famously said, The sin underneath all our sins is to trust the lie of the serpent, that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ and must take matters into our own hands. And that's the same mindset that leads Paul to imprison Christians and put them to death and stop the spread of the gospel. It's the same mindset that leads to the worry and anxiety in the life of the has-it-together, middle-class, nice, respectable Christian who just struggles with anxiety because they've disregarded the role of God in their life as well. Both have disregarded God, it's just playing out in different ways. Both have pushed God out of the center, it's just, it's just coming to bear fruit in different ways. Ways. And so what we begin to see is maybe on the surface the things that I do are better than other people. But what ties us all together is that all of us are kind of doing our own thing because all of us have rebelled and rejected God in our own way. All of us have, have wanted to be in the center and to be in control. And all of us kind of live out of this mindset of I don't need someone to tell me what to do. I, I know what's best for me. I want to be in control. And it might look different for you than someone that it does that maybe you don't even know. But both want to be out from under the rule and reign of God because we want to be free. 
And that's not just the mindset, but it's also who is the sin against. And when we sin, it's not just a mistake that we've made. It's not just a goof up. That it is, as hard as it is to say, an act of rebellion against the God who created us and who's called us to holiness. And part of the struggle we have with seeing our sin correctly is because we don't see God correctly. And that if we saw God for who he was, we would see our sin in a much clearer light. That you think about most people who assess their sin in light of this God who is this gentle, grandfatherly big man upstairs, and sin against that God doesn't seem like that big of a deal. And then you see a vision like Isaiah catches in Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 5, when he writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With uh, two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house house was filled with smoke, and Isaiah's only response to catching this vision of God, which we should say Isaiah, a prophet for God, who had given his life in service to God, that if anyone could compare himself to the people around him, he should have felt pretty good about himself. What's his response in verse 5? And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And Isaiah has that reaction. And Moses in Exodus 33 and 34, when he sees the glory of God, has that reaction. And Ezekiel, at the beginning of his book, has that reaction of seeing the glory of God. And scripture's full of stories like this, that when people encounter the living God, they are awed at what they see. They can't comprehend what they see. And they begin to understand just how great a distance there is between who they are and where God has called them to be, between who they are and who God is. And once we finally see ourselves in that light, what becomes clear for all of us, all of us need saving from something. That it's when we finally see our sin for what it is, when we finally see ourselves for who we are and believe what Scripture says about us, that we've all rebelled, we've all rejected, we've all pushed God aside, then that means all of us need saving regardless of what life has looked like up to this point. And again, when we come to a right understanding of the wickedness of our sins, it, it reveals how silly the belief is that we can actually say ourselves. I love this comparison, and Sarah writes in his book, he says, the way that most people conceive of what will make God happy or paying back God for their sins is like this. Maybe you've done, I know I've done this plenty of times. You go to a restaurant and you just ordered the worst thing you can find on the menu. Okay, you're, just, you're hungry. You just, you give me the biggest burger, all the toppings, all the fries, throw a milkshake in, put the sauce on it. And it's just any trip to DT Curtis. Okay, it's just that kind of meal you're sitting down for. Okay, and there's this assumption that somehow the Diet Coke cancels all of this out. Okay? Here's what I'm saying, right? That for most people, here's what their relationship with God is like. What are our good deeds? They're the Diet Coke. What's the assumption? This cancels all of that out. And yet, what he writes is, no, when you look at Scripture and you see what it says about our sin, when you see what it says about what our sin deserves... Our tiny, small, frail, good deeds could never cancel out on its own the debt that we owe to God. And so what does that mean? It's saving from something. And yet so many people will stand before God and what they will trust in to cancel out the evil deeds that they did will be things like this. But didn't we say grace before debtor? But didn't we uh, believe prayer should be in school? But didn't we go to church? But didn't we believe in God? But when, didn't we get a, a misty eye when I heard uh, God bless America? Didn't we give money to the church? Didn't we treat women with respect? Didn't we own Bibles? Didn't we get our babies dedicated? Didn't we uh, stay married and faithful? And if we're being honest, a lot of those assumptions kind of lay underneath the surface and give us this false confidence. You know what, on the last day I'll be okay. Why? Because some of those things were true of me. And those aren't necessarily bad things. Most of those are very good things. They just can't cancel out everything that's over here. 
And it's why Paul could write in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature all human beings, every person who's ever lived, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And again, it's hard for us to see this as we compare ourselves to other people, but when we compare ourselves to God, what becomes true? This is true of me too. This is what I deserve from God. This is what I, I rightly should stand under his wrath and his judgment as a creature, as a, a creature created by my creator who has stood in rebellion, who has pushed him away, who has gone my, my own direction, who has wanted to live free from him. And yet the hope that we have is what? Paul understood that's who he was, but what did he say? But I was shown grace and mercy and faith and hope and love and what can be true of us today as well that we can be shown the same thing as soon as we're willing to admit we're people in need of being saved the band can come up we'll look at this passage as kind of a final passage today 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 Paul's ex best explanation of how this change happened in his life for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What's the hope that we have for being made right with God? It's not that God just magically forgets about those sinful things that we've done. It's not that he comes to us at the end and says, you know what, those things actually weren't that big of a deal. It's that Jesus comes to earth, as Paul writes in 1 Timothy, to save sinners, to do something for us we can't do on our own, and that the hope that we have is what he's done for us, not what we've done to make things right. Paul Zoll writes in his book, Who Will Deliver Us? He says, we're a little bit like a, a duck hunter he heard about who was hunting with his friend in a wide open barren of land in southeastern Georgia. Far away on the horizon, he noticed a cloud of smoke, and soon he could hear the sound of crackling. A wind came up, and he realized the terrible truth. A brush fire was coming their way, and it was moving so fast that they weren't going to be able to outrun it. The hunter began to rifle through his pockets. He emptied all the contents of his knapsack. He soon found what he was looking for, a book of matches. He said to his friend's amazement, he pulled out a match and struck it. He lit a small fire around the two of them. And soon they were standing in a circle of blackened earth waiting for the brush fire to come. They didn't have to wait long. They covered their mouths uh, with their handkerchiefs and braced themselves. The fire came near and swept over them, but they were completely unhurt and untouched because fire would not burn the place where the fire had already burned. Okay? And what does that have to do with us? That the heart of what Jesus accomplished on the cross for us is this, is that for those who are in Christ and have put their hope and their faith and their trust in Jesus, what we read about in Ephesians 2, 3, that we're by nature children of wrath, that Jesus takes that judgment on himself, that on the cross Jesus takes my sin and my guilt and my shame and my rebellion against God, that he puts it on his shoulders, that God the Father pours out on Jesus on the cross the judgment I deserve, the wrath I deserve, the separation from God that I deserve, and that as Jesus takes those things on himself, and as I come to faith in Jesus, and Jesus covers me, what's true in the story we just read is true of all believers, that judgment cannot come where the judgment's already come. And that as Jesus takes our judgment on himself, we find ourselves forgiven, we find ourselves with the ability to receive mercy and grace, to be made a part of the family of God, to be made a part of the people of God, not because our good outweighs our bad, but because Jesus died the death that we deserve to die. Jesus lived the perfect sinless life we could never live and gives us credit for that, and that we can stand before God holy and saints and forgiven, and all of these things that Scripture uses to describe us. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of all that Jesus has done for us. We need saved from something, and Jesus stands ready and willing to save us from it all. What's our response have to be? We have to confess and admit that we need saving. And so maybe as we get ready to stand and sing this morning, for some of us, what today is, is this. I've been in church for years, but I never actually believed that. That I was bad enough to need saving. That my sin was evil enough that the judgment of God was rightly on me? 
And yet if we believe that this is the word of God and that these are true things spoken to us, we have to stand with this new realization, that is who I am, that is who I was, that, that I do need saved from something, that this isn't just for a, a gospel for those wicked people out there, it's a gospel for me and maybe I believe it for the first time today. That maybe for some of us it's, it's an opportunity to stand and worship and grow in thankfulness because as the church we regularly hear this message over and over and it gives us the opportunity to stand and sing and worship. Or maybe it's an opportunity to, to ask God how we see this and actually believe it because just naturally what's going to begin to flow out is worship and love and faith and all of these things that we see. And maybe, and we'll begin to ask this next week, if we really believe this, what kind of life does that lead us into? But before we can ask that question, we just have to just stay here for a moment and ask, do we actually believe this is true, and do I actually believe this is true about me? And if it is, we stand and sing and praise and thank Jesus for all that he's done for us.